Assalamualaikum and welcome to this gorgeous Saturday morning. It's another edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. Lots coming up your way on the show. We're going to be talking to biochemist Fatima Patel about uh, the nosy Newton. Sounds absolutely fascinating, but also there's a serious side to that discussion. Then we look at uh, World Water Day with Dr. Sudhir Pillay. He's a research manager at the Water Research Commission. And as always, once a month, we host, or rather I'd say we have a partnership with Islamic Care Line where we discuss family matters right here on Let's Talk. Once again, we've been joined by the lovely Suraya Nawab. She's at Care Line, has been with them for over 20 years, and we're here to talk family matters. We started out this discussion a month ago talking about the extended family support structure, the importance and the value of fam extended families. But we're now going to be looking at another dimension of extended families, the problematic dimension of extended families, and inshallah, we will unpack that in as much detail as we can. Suraya Nawab, Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's actually been 26 years. 26, alhamdulillah, and may you <laughs> grow stronger Amen. and longer with an amazing organization, uh, organization offering the type of support we wouldn't have been able to access anywhere else. Yeah. So please continue doing the Thanks. amazing work that yeah. you guys do. Uh, now we started talking extend, extended families in a previous program, the value, the benefits, mm. um, and of course the cohesiveness yes. um, with extended families, how you're able to overcome problems and how you're able to live uh, in a co cohesive family unit. Mm. But that's not necessarily always the case. Yes. I mean, shortly after we did the show, I had lots of callers. Mm. Um, talking about the downsides yes. to extend, extended families. Mm. And the one big thing that was brought up, two issues, we'll, uh, we'll address the one in the first part of the show and the second issue in the second part. The first issue was where grandparents in an extended family feel that they are glorified babysitters. Mm. And the second issue is all forms of abuse, sexual and otherwise, mm. in an extended family situation. Yes. So over to you to start with the first part, to respond to the first part, and that is where grandparents feel used mm. and abused. Yeah. Okay, Bismillah rahman rahim and once again, thanks for having us on uh, with this partnership uh, and on your show. Um, we agreed at the end of the last uh, session that we had together on air um, that there are many other dimensions to extended family relationships and that we will continue with the, with the programs in terms of explaining what is happening and, and make more sense of um, extended family relationships and how they work and how, or how they don't work. And now, extended families for me, especially in the case where grandparents are feeling abused in a sense, um, has two parts. The one is where you still find a, a, a minimum of cases, but you still find the extended family under one roof. Okay, so the, 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 the young couple may be having just a, a part of the extension of the house, but they're still under one roof, okay? But extended families can also work in, like we said, ideally, they should be close to parents, especially aging parents, but away. So maybe in the same city or in the same vicinity or just close by so that they or could even have... possibly a granny cottage on yeah. the property yeah. and they but have their complete privacy. Complete privacy, cooking facilities separate uh, and all of that. So there are two scenarios in terms of extended families, but in the in the situation where extended fam the extended family system is where the the couple are living under the same roof or very close by 
um, there's more of a possibility of them just taking for granted that uh, we'll have kids and we spoke that most young couples today are dual income families now because women, the young wives have also been educated, have been through, uh, have been working, have had good jobs and with the cost of living and with everything going on around us in terms of the expenses that we have with ourselves and our kids, it, 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 it's become a necessity to actually have dual incomes. So then in that situation, it's just a given that no, we'll have kids and it's fine and the, and, and the mum-in-law will look after the children and I'll carry on as normal, go to work and come back um, and so on. And that does cause a lot of tension because at the same time as young women are more educated and more out there, young mother-in-laws are just as busy it's not like they all stay at home mums and they they just take us here sitting here we've got grandkids um but we also have our own lives in terms of our work <laughs> absolutely and so um there would be cases where grandparents would willingly say look i'm i'm a stay at home mum um or granny and uh, I, i'll look after the kids but i think even the older people need to be very careful with that because I know you mean well to try and assist your, the young couple to say, you people carry on working, but we'll, I'll, I'll take care of the kids. It's an everyday, at least 8 to 12 hour or 8 to 10 hour job. And it okay? is absolutely exhausting because it what is. needs to be taken into account is that um, grandparents are not spring chickens. Yes. They can't do yeah. what they used to do 10, 20 and 30 yeah. years ago. Their energy levels yes. are, you know, they, they're really going yes. down. Yeah. They can't cope with the demands of younger children. That's another thing. The running yeah. around, being behind them. Yes. And then also the possibility of assisting with homework yes in most instances it's totally beyond their understanding with the new methods of teaching the maths the science etc 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 so it's a huge huge ask to commit to something to, like that absolutely so I think both the young couple as well as the mom-in-law who's at home now who would be doing most of the of the caregiving for the children need to take that into account so I think then, for me, ideally, there would be a situation where the young couple would approach approach the, the, the father-in-law and mother-in-law and say, or even if it's just the mom-in-law, to say, we're having a baby now, but we still want to, but my wife is going to be on maternity leave for five months or whatever, and she'll be there. Is it possible that she can still, and then also to revisit that from time to time because as children grow up then it's school and running around to school, nursery and back and then extra murals mom's and back taxi. and mom's taxi and so i don't know you, you you may have seen this long explanation about grannies and nannies and at the end it says i'm a nanny not a nanny <laughs> no i haven't so, <laughs> however what about when a young couple have married and they're going to start a family mm. and it's almost expected that nani or daddy mm. is going to be taking care mm. of the little one because we're going back to work yes how do you start how do you start that conversation without any hurt feelings yes. or any rejection on yeah. the part of the daughter or the daughter-in-law yes. suggesting I'm really looking forward to being a granny yes. but I'm unable to become a full-time caregiver yes okay how do you how do you navigate that? I, I think it's a very important um, question and I think it's something that we need to um, expand on for the viewers to actually take cognizance of Obviously, if they've been living like that in that extended family system for a while, look, there are the normal daily niggles that mum-in-law and daughter-in-law have and all that, but basically it, it probably and hopefully, inshallah, it's been a good constructive relationship where each one is recognized for their role in this family and there's no question of abuse, which, we, which we'll talk about in the later part of the show, but they have a, a fairly good relationship, whether they having meals on their own and share some meals and they help each other out it's so you are very correct to say that we need to protect it and the way to approach something like this would be i would think 
it is the responsibility of the young couple to say, and no, that daddy and nanny is now, are now so excited that they're going to maybe a first grandchild. And they really, and I mean, grandchildren can be loved to bits. And no oh, matter absolutely. what, our kids tell us all the time, you never allowed me to do that, <laughs> but look at what he's doing or look right. at what she's doing. Um, so that's, that's, that, that's that granny instinct that we have with, within us and daddies and nannies together. But I would think that it's the responsibility of the young couple to then share the new good news that they're going to be grandparents. But in a short while after that, to start to start the conversation and say, mom, and I would think that the, the father in this young couple, the expectant father should actually, because it's his parents most of the time, or if it's her parents, then she should actually approach it and say, you know what, we're having this baby, but you know, we both of us work, we're going to need to continue working. I'm going to be taking leave, maternity leave for three or five months, whatever, and I'll be there. And do you think you'll manage with it? The other important thing is most young couples who work um, hopefully have enough of an income to obviously bring up. And Allah, Rosie comes from Allah. But what works very well is for, for the young couple to say, okay, if you, especially taking into consideration lifestyle diseases that the older people may be having, diabetes, uh, hypertension, all those things, it adds stress. to. A, and bringing up babies today is a completely different story. You go into a baby store now, you won't understand half the gadgets true, that there are there. So you must understand, as you said earlier, for an older person to get used to all of that. But what helps is if you can afford a nanny. So mom or mommy-in-law so, can just supervise oversee. her. So you see that the child eat, has meals, you see. And you know, if it's an older child, you see that they go to the toilet properly and they're taken care of and they're safe uh, in a safe environment. Because let's face it, even if you take your child out to a daycare center for the day, there are many more risks there than within a home that you are familiar with and the child that the child will grow up with. So I think um, looking at your expenses and budgeting and, and you know what, uh, from the care line again, uh, experiences show that budgeting is becoming ever more increasingly important, especially for all couples because of the cost of living, because of the various expenses we have and so on. But like this, so they, in this situation, they would sit and budget and say, okay, we can take out a small amount and, and pay a nanny to actually help my mom or mom-in-law, you know? And so the responsibility is there because she can also then continue with her life, whether she's housekeeping, cooking, going out, visiting a friend, visiting some, going to a janaza. She's not stuck to say that, you know what, I, I can't go because I'm babysitting. Okay, let's go for our so, first ad break. We'll be back in a minute or two. Okay. So Ryan Awam from Islamic Care Line is here. We're talking family matters. We're talking the extended family situation. And this time around, we're talking about the fact that grandparents sometimes feel that they are being abused. They're being taken advantage of. Their children are treating them as glorified nannies and glorified uh, babysitters. More of that right after the ad break. And still to come on the show, we're going to be talking nosy newtons with the lovely Fatima Patel. She's a biochemist and she's come up with this amazing concept for the little darlings in our lives. We're also going to be looking at World Water Day. But right now we're talking about grandparents who believe they're being abused, who believe that young people or young children or their family members take them for granted and treat them as glorified nannies. Suraya, back to you, Islamic Care Line Family Matters. Okay. Back on the subject of taking care of our grandchildren. Mm. What about a situation where uh, it has been, the status quo has been in place for the past 10 mm. years, and it's just kind of expected you've done it for the eldest son, yes, you've yeah. done it for the second son, <laughs> and now the third uh, child comes along and they've started a family. 
you don't have the physical capacity and the mental capacity to, to deal, deal with, with all it. of the stuff. Yes. And you're now wanting to say no, but you don't know how. Mm. Your children keep overriding mm. you and telling you you're just a moaner. Mm. Okay, so I think again it comes down to negotiation and communication styles and patterns and things like that. Um, I think if a granny is in that situation and really feeling stuck and cannot really verbalize because she's been a submissive mum or wife or granny all her life. And she feels guilty because she loves those children she unconditionally. Loves them. Absolutely. Um, if she can call on her spouse to help, I think that helps a lot. But I would like to think that she can herself sit down with this couple and say to them, this is what I can do and this is what I cannot do. This is my my state of health presently, so I'll manage to do this or I won't manage to do this any longer, you know. So I think it's about communication. I think it's, if you know what, when you start throwing snide remarks and you come, you come across as being really angry about it or you, because you're keeping it in, you're not saying it and you're carrying on with the normal chores but you're not yourself, they're going to pick it up and that's going to cause more problems. For me, it's much better to have this open relationship and and even that comes with practice from the very beginning <laughs> so from the beginning when you when you have so if even if so a, what you are what i'm hearing you say is perhaps you kind of go so you, you go into an informal contract yes. and you put timelines down yeah, because absolutely. if you reach a point where you're unable to there's no hard feelings or no hurt feelings yes, yes. but now what if your children will not hear you they won't they want to engage with you. They walk away from a discussion. I'm wondering if journalizing, writing them a letter, would that, that can work? help? That can help. But I would still think sit down with them and speak to them and take them because the letter is not going to fully um, explain how you're feeling. I love these kids. I want them around me, but I cannot take care of them full time for much longer, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, also, what we found at the office what, that works also is that, look, there may be some grandparents who are, and again, both daddy and nanny side, who may be financially okay and quite stable, and they may not need an income, but at least giving, paying towards the upkeep of your child would help. Then there are parents, or especially a lot of widows, who take on the care of their grand grandchildren. And if the young couple can think that, you know what, we'll pay the expenses of her home for her, because at least that will be lifting a big burden from her. Anyway, the, the, the son, if the dad is, has passed on, the son has the responsibility. And this way, if she's also able to look after the, the, the grandkids, but they offer something to say, I mean, she may very, the granny may very well say, no, 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 I don't need anything, it's fine. But I think, again, with today's world out there, economically and otherwise, it always helps, and I know of many young couples who are actually doing that. So instead of paying um, a nanny outside, from outside, who is a stranger really, you, you're paying your, your mum, and she, it helps her, and at the same time, you, you are sending your child off uh, every day knowing being comfortable in the fact that they are safe and, and all of that. And you'll find that many times in the extended family system where they live under one roof, anyway, it's the son's responsibility to be taking care of the normal utilities and things like that, food and, and all of that, right? So the son would do that, but then expect the parents to look after his children yes. because I am because supporting you. I am you. supporting you. I'm so, paying the rental. Absolutely. I'm paying the utilities. How do you navigate that conversation? Because now they expect you to look after the children yes. just because you're living in the house. Yes. That's number one. And then number two, also the fact that when things get too much for you, even though they're paying you an allowance to look after their children, mm. 
um, they expect blood out of you. Yeah. So whereas mm. it should have been an eight to five um, mm. scenario, Continuous. Monday to Friday, yes. they take advantage of the mother-in-law or the mother or the granny, and they kind of rock up at all hours. Mm. And even on the weekend, if yeah. they've got things to do, they just assume yes. granny's going to look after the yes. children. Because we pay her or because she lives in our home, yeah. she should be grateful should, or thankful absolutely. that we're providing her a roof. It is said that today kids are even thinking that way, but it's a reality, okay? But at the same time, I think the, um, as you said, I, I like what you use, the word you use is an informal agreement, informal contract with them. So I, I would say for all the grannies or granddads out there, when you find yourself in a situation like this, try and negotiate it and talk about it. Don't allow it to just be taken for granted that we are here. So you can, you can talk to the, to the young couple and say, look, you, you people go to work from eight to five, so we'll be fine. But after that, you know, we, we need our space as well. Weekends, we also have a life out there. We have functions to attend or just relax what's out with each other or if, go out yeah. if I'm available exactly. and if I'm at home and you know what works very well I find is that now most families have these family chats on whatsapp you know your your intimate family True. thing and and so uh, even that if you can't verbalize it helps to just ask mom are you home this weekend Do we have a wedding uh, can we drop the kids off or mm -hmm. you know will you babysit for an evening or something but not just take for granted that they find they'll we'll drop them off they'll be fine they'll stay there you know i think setting boundaries uh, uh, is a responsible of both sides and especially the young couple it's their need doesn't matter whether they they paying the expenses of the home or they paying towards the, the uh, uh, stipend or whatever to the to the granny um, or even if they give it as a gift or whatever it is the primary responsibility I would say is on this young couple if they are both out there working they're intelligent they're young they know the world out there they are uh, they can uh, understand what is happening they see their parents getting older and all the health issues that come there I think they should take the primary responsibility but failing that I think the grandparents should not take a back seat and be completely submissive if they see that is not happening they need to as you say in an informal way start talking about it not make a big issue of it so that everybody feels uncomfortable but they need to know you know let's look at the issue of abuse now because that could be a form of abuse yes i mean if you're taking if you're taking your parents in law your, or your mom for, for granted, granted and just expect her to be at your beck and call with your children yeah. that is a form of yes. abuse and she's unable to verbalize her, her anger, feelings and frustration her, anger. her unmet needs yes. etc yes yeah um that is and and um Elder abuse is, an, is, a, is, a, is another topic for another day because that is also becoming quite prevalent in our community, unfortunately. But when you, yes, that is a, that is a form of abuse. And we, when you talk about, uh, and we spoke about this on our last program, that in them days, the extended family system was the only system available where the parents had a home and the son gets married and comes and lives um, with his wife in the same home and that was that normal normalized sort of extended system um, and they even especially I think there has been a slight reduction in the prevalence of of sexual or economic or physical abuse uh, in that scenario but I, I know and we both spoke earlier um, in the break that that used to be quite uh, pronounced and very prevalent many years ago where um, there used to be sexual abuse especially between the father-in-law and the daughter-in-law or even just molestation and we've we've had couples um, or we've had women come to the care line after many 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 years and uh, they having issues in their marriages or or just not social socially coping and when they come in for counseling then that is identified as one of the contributory factors to her feeling this inadequate or low self-esteem and things like that um, we've also had cases where people wanted to actually because then you also had uncles and aunts living together it wasn't just the the extended family in terms of husband uh, son and uh, 
son and father, uh, but also uncles and aunts. And so that complicated matters a lot. And then there used to be a lot of sexual abuse happening. And as I said, maybe not sexual abuse, but sexual molestation or harassment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it used to be very prevalent. I think there are still cases where that does happen. But I think uh, young women are more aware now, they're more assertive now. Uh, I think young men are also more observant of what is happening. So uh, it's not so easily done. Okay. Then um, the thing about financial abuse is also another thing, especially we also know one of the phenomena in our uh, family relationships um, ongoing is that we have very young uh, sons saying they want to marry or very young daughters saying they want and they have no income of their own right but nikah is nikah and we know that if your son comes to you say i want to make uh, nikah you're not going to say no for 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 just any reason uh, unless you have something valid to say maybe let's talk about it a bit more is this right are you happy with another you know, family girl whatever but when it comes to finances, then they live under the same roof and they may be still going out to study or finding a job or whatever, or even not, uh, not doing anything, but married and not having any income. When, when that happens, then there is quite, and obviously you can understand, there'll be a likelihood of the older parents in this extended family relationship saying, but we have to support another whole lifestyle, you know? So, um, she can't ask for anything that she wants. Um, she has to be very careful about what she uses, how she cooks, how much water she uses, how much electricity she's using because she always keeps the TV on or she, you know, things like that. Those things still happen, I think. Even in the, in the extended family relationships, maybe saying maybe there's a cottage or maybe there's a, a, a little way away, but the building belongs to the parents, they would be, look at the bill for the, for the utilities this month. What are you doing? You know, that sort of thing. And those sort of comments um, are definitely a form of abuse, of verbal and abuse. we're going to have to pick up Inshallah next month <laughs> at the same time because we've just scratched the surface. We need to explore this in more detail. Definitely. But at least we've given some information to moms and moms-in-law yes. out there uh, in terms of you can say no yes. you can say no in a very respectful way Absolutely. and there's no reason why your children shouldn't and can't mm. understand accede to your obviously your uh, request mm. yeah, very um, valid request actually. absolutely but if you do get uh, couples or you do get parents that are just unable yeah. to navigate those yeah. those, those discussions Counseling. Counseling. It'll help. A pick up great the phone deal. to pick Islamic Airline, phone. give us the number, let them talk to you, and you'll give them the <laughs> yeah, advice. 373 and any one of the counselors would be able to help you. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of learning negotiation skills and, um, and mediation, a lot mm -hmm. of mediation, and we do that. Inshallah. Um, so, inshallah, it can help a lot of parents out there who can't manage this. So we're them. all about, I wouldn't say happy families, well-adjusted families. Yes. And that's yes. where we leave the Islamic Airline uh, interview with Surayi Nawab. We certainly will pick up on where we've left off, inshallah, in a month's time. Still to come, we're going to talk World Water Day. And later on, um, I'm so, so struck by this amazing um, nosy Newtons. I think it's an exciting concept. And we're waiting for Fatima Patel to join us to talk about it. And welcome back. We have Dr. Sudhir Pillay. He's a research manager at the Water Research Commission. We're going to be talking about World Water Day. Morning, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, you know, it's, it's bad enough that we have situations, the ongoing rolling blackouts with Eskom. I think South Africa is really very, very frustrated. And here you are sitting in studio talking to me about World Water Day. And we're also worried. We get a sense that because of the rolling blackouts is going to be huge impact on water supply. Are we correct in thinking that or is it just caremongering? I think it's a bit of caremongering. Okay. I, I think you're not going to have such big problems. 
I mean, when the pumps, you know, the water reservoirs and the pumps, won't they run dry at any point? No, I think, uh, no, that won't happen because you have people that are managing the water supply. What we need to realize is that South Africa, in terms of water supply and demand, we have very uneven rainfall. We're one of the dry countries. But in terms of how much water we use, we are above the global average. So we're in the top 30 for one of water scarcity. But we use more water than we should. Oh. OK, and this is one of the major problems. Mm -hmm. Um, Why are we so unwise in our water usage? What, what has gone wrong? Why are we not educated enough to use water sparingly? I had um, a new helper start with me and I was aghast at the way she let the water, you know, she opened the water at full throttle and the water was just to, to rinse a cup. And I said to her, you know, it's such a scarce resource and you are really wasting a very scarce resource. And it, that action suggested to me that we're not creating enough awareness. I agree with you. Um, yes, there's not enough awareness how valuable water is until we lose it. Oh. So if you look at Cape Town, people are still using enough water, but only when they realize our dams are really, really low, mm. let's start saving. That saving should have happened a long time ago. Are they still with that ongoing saving They're still uh, saving, but program. if you look... Uh, on the eastern coast. There are other mm -hmm. places that were in similar situation in Cape Town mm. that are having similar problems. What our science is showing us is that a climate variability is increasing. So we're having more frequent droughts, more frequent floods, and this is disrupting our water supply mm. by 2030. So this is all to do with global warming? It has a bit, but it's also on our own behavior and how we value water. And of course, how are we damaging our environment? Yes. Before we get there, Dr. Sudhir Pillay, you're a research manager at the Water Research Commission. So what exactly is the commission? How are you tied in with possibly, because I presume you are stationed in Johannesburg. So what's your connection perhaps to Rand Water Board and other such entities? Well, the Water Research Commission was established in 1971, specifically for water problems. Okay, because South Africa was experiencing a lot of droughts. So they said, as a government, let's establish the research to develop solutions for all these droughts. And from there, it blossomed. Uh, and so we designed solutions. Um, we, we don't do the work. We don't have laboratories ourselves. We fund that to universities. Some people like Rand Water, or oh, Amgeni Water. They will do some research and look at new solutions that are more efficient. So this is the space we play in. My specific role within the Water Research Commission, I work with toilets. Ooh. Okay. I've heard somewhere that we are losing absolutely valuable water capacity through the flushing of our toilets. And the other suggestion was we should be doing what other countries overseas are doing as far as flushing our toilets are concerned. Is there another option? If there is, what is it and how effective would that be? Okay, and this is what we're working on. And this is the question I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm asking you a question. Sorry to turn it around on you. But would you take a cola or fruit juice and put it in your toilet and flush your poop with it? Absolutely not. So why do we do it with our water? But then obviously it is, we need to be pointing a finger to governments um, and the role players in setting up our infrastructures. Why have they not? I mean, we are now in the 21st century. If this was not the way to go, there was plenty of time to turn the situation around. So whom do we blame? <sighs> Who needs to take accountability and ownership of this problem? And what is the answer? The accountability what is, the alter yeah, is what everyone is the as a society. For 150 years, our toilet hasn't changed. Why? 150 years, we take six to nine liters, I mean, sometimes more, 12 liters. In South Africa, it's clean drinking water, not like the rest of other African countries. It's clean, portable, perfectly clean water, and we flush our poop with it. So we're trying to change this. But you have to change your whole ecosystem, and this is what we're trying to do. And it's going to cost the country a lot of money. It can, but it's also going to save. Okay, in the long run. In the long run. What are the alternatives? 
Um, I, I've been told that there are very viable alternatives being used elsewhere in the world. Talk to us about those. Let us start applying our minds to it and start getting used to the idea. You know, like with Eskom, we're looking at genera uh, generators as our source of power. We're looking at solar systems, etc. So surely we can start applying our minds to the water issue. We actually are. And, and if you actually Google Bill Gates, toilets, Bill Gates and toilets. Okay. South Africa is one of the forefront runners in this and putting these new toilets in that reuse water, doesn't require energy and cheats everything on site. So we're testing these at the moment. But you need this type of verification and to protect human health because that's the main point. Obviously. So a lot of testing has to go and we put in field conditions and we test this. But South Africa is one of the four one, forefront runners in doing this and testing this. So you're busy in the test phase. Busy what the is test. the end result going to look like? What are you hoping it's going to look like? And if it is viable, um, how soon will it be introduced into South Africa? Well, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at trying to commercialize it. Commercialize it. We're looking at standards. So our own Bureau of Standards is looking at being involved in standards. It's just similar to your microwave. It's a household appliance. You need to make sure it's safe and it passes a certain standard. So a lot of these processes are ongoing at the moment. Are you not allowed to talk about it in too much detail? We can. You can. As much detail as you want to. So share the details with us let us, as i've said let's apply our minds to it. let's get used to this concept that hopefully we're going to be embracing in a couple of years time okay from my side and my specialty 30 percent of your drinking water is flushed on the toilet of course but that's just one small component the water saving is also in your taps what type of um, how you use water and those type of things and um, i think this would be important because i'm here with itv uh, we did a study uh, that was done by the University of Cape Town. They look at water reclamation from a religious point of view, from an Islamic point of view, okay? And this was very interesting for us because in the Tukwini region, they were running out of water. So they wanted to take the wastewater and convert it straight into portable drinking water, okay? Now, in other parts in Namibia, they have that because they they dry, Buford West also has it. Is it safe enough for drinking? Well, this is the thing. Your, your taps are coming safe. So there are standards and processes. Mm -hmm. And this is the worry. Is it safe enough to drink? And this is what is coming out. But the more important message I think that came out when we did the study was that there was no religious basis for water reclamation to tap. If you look at some of the more uh, Muslim dominated countries in the Arab states, they are very dry. They have no option but to use it, okay? And in Buford West, none of the Muslim residents complained because you have nothing, as long as it's pure and clean. And one of the important messages that we found from the study was uh, when we spoke to religious leaders and we asked them, uh, you know, what, 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 why, why, is this issue, why is this issue? They actually looked at the scriptures and said there's no real issue. I know mm. it's based mm. on the purity of the water, mm. as long as the water is pure. Okay, so the point you're making is that you've met with resistance. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm, didn't meet with resistance, but it was not a, a religious basis for resistance. Okay, let's go for an ad break. We'll talk some more okay. right after. We're talking World Water Day with uh, Dr. Sudhir Pele, and we're going to hear what are the type of messages that are going to go out on wo wo World Water Day, but also our responsibility, how we become more responsible in utilizing a very, very scarce resource, and that is water. Dr. Sudhir Pillay is my guest. We're talking World Water Day. We're talking, uh, we're talking water scarcity, not only in South Africa, but uh, all around the world. Uh, before the ad break, you were talking about the Muslim view on uh, recycled water and also water conservation. Uh, was that positive? Was that a positive experience on your part? It was a positive experience. And one of the positive experiences is that a lot of the religious leaders took and gave the water saving and water conservation messages to the communities. And we found there was a big drive from the community to save water. 
Um, and they use even the scriptures um, within the Quran to, to portray this message uh, from all living life. Of course, of course. From what all living life is mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. and those type of issues. And, and they, they brought it out to the fore and they encouraged communities to use water more sparingly, as it is said in the scriptures. <sighs> We know that Cape Town had a huge problem last year and the year before. Has that situation changed? There was also talk around desalination of seawater. Your view on those two issues and what does the rest of the country look like going forward? The Cape Town situation, um, they rely on a winter rainfall. I think we will get a better picture after this winter. Uh -huh and they're not like the rest of the country. So their dams usually fill up during, during the winter, winter time. Winter time. So we'll have a better picture of what's going on. I think the desalination approach, okay, it's, it is an approach, it's just another technical approach. But if you look at the cost of it, it's quite expensive. It's being used in other parts of the world, very especially in the Middle East, and it seems to be working for them well, even though it comes at a cost. Is it not feasible for us here in South Africa? We can, we can use it, but where does that cost and who pays for that expense? The taxpayer, <laughs> <laughs> as always. If we look at just reducing our own water demand as a household, okay, don't let the tap run. Why we, do, do we need to use 12 litres to flush? You let's come in, yeah, yeah, let's come back to that point. You, you're busy working on a contraption um, or a, 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 a microwave type of unit that is going to work at getting rid of our toilet waste. What about odor? Will it get rid of the odor as well in a toilet or in a bathroom? Yeah. How effective and efficient is it going to be? How big is the unit? Let's look at costs as well and how soon is it going to go to market? Okay, if you look at South Africa, only 60% of our population have flush toilets. Did right, you? of course. Okay. The reason why this is because water infrastructure is very expensive. Billions of rands. Where there was no infrastructure, putting it's going to cost billions of rands. On top of that, we don't have enough water to do that. So we need other options. So this is why we're developing this new way of toilet. And one of the important things, if you look at the bottom of your toilet, you see water. Yes. That water prevents smells from coming up. That's the whole point of that water okay. water. Okay. It prevents smells from coming up. Right. But there's, we can redo that and we use non-novel processes. As I said, our toilet hasn't changed in 150 years, the design. We're still using this old wasteful design. And Okay. South Africa's drinking water that we flush. Right. I'm trying to get a picture of this new wave unit. Um, is it going to be workable? And cost. And is it going to take the odors out of the bathroom more importantly? Well, there are different types of toilets. And so we're working on various circumstances. Uh, one for schools and they're all different engineering approaches. So Why is that? Because it's, it's quite difficult um, you know, to use one process. One place might not have any electricity. Uh -huh. um, so how do you flush? Um, what we're trying to do with a lot of these toilets um, is reuse the water, not be reliant on energy, and make products from it. You'd be surprised that you can make oils and different other type of charcoals from your toilet waste. So we're trying to do this to, to try and incentivize the industry to come and service your toilet, especially for poor people um, or indigenous people. So are you saying that we'll still continue utilizing our current toilets with the water flush system, but industry will come along and remove the waste and recycle the waste? Yes. So that way you're not losing totally. Your water usage will kind of almost counterbalance with the extra money coming in with the recycling. Yeah, we try and use our water more efficiently and use it better, and this is what it's all about. Have I misunderstood? I've been told that there are certain countries abroad that don't use water flush toilets. Is that true? If it is true, what is it that they're using? How do they get rid of their um, toilet waste? Well, most Western or developed countries use a flush system. They do? They do. Mm -hmm. Except if it's in a very rural, mountainous area. Like Obviously. It's just too difficult. 
most of Africa, a large part of Asia, they can't afford to put flush toilets in. So they used basically a hole in the ground. Okay. And that's not a proper type of toilet system. Okay. Um, going forward then, um, we'll watch the space. How soon is this going to be introduced to the market? Well, this is what we're working on. And, and recently in October, Bill Gates took a jar of poop with him into Beijing and he said, this is the new toilet of the future and this is what we're going to be doing and we're testing it. And the whole point of what we're trying to do now is how do we make it more cost effective and cheaper? So we're not going to use water. It's not going to be water reliant at all. It will use water, but it'll use Minimally. it wiser and okay. better. Okay. So not like a microwave that's going to almost you know, incinerate the waste. Some do. Some do. Some do, but we want to take all that water back and use it for flushing. Okay. Uh, we watch the space. Give me a timeline. Well, at the moment, we've got a lot of them in the ground and we're testing them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is a quite a difficult question because it's new and something new mm. and something. So we need to get user feedback and ask people, hey, does this compare? But some of these toilets look just like normal toilets. But we also need that feedback from users because ultimately it will be you that will be using it. Costs? Costs are expensive at the okay. moment because they're at the prototype stage. Of course. Once you get factories built and you start making them on scale, the costs will drop. So this is what we're trying to do at the moment. So we're talking about, obviously, a new type of toilet. In the near future, we hope to save water. What is the strong message for World Water Day? Um, and of course, our current situation, we've talked Cape Town, we've talked desalination. It's not an option at this point in time. What other options do we have on the table and how do we save water? Okay, um, the, the UN World Water Day, the theme, every year it's a different theme. So this year is leave no one behind. <laughs> okay. Okay, and I think South Africa. Meaning? Well, uh, within the context of South Africa, yes. we've done a lot of work. A lot of people have access to water. If you compare pre-1994, a lot of people have water, but there's still a small percentage that we haven't reached. And, and so it's looking at people that are disabled, those that are in very rural areas, it's just too difficult to get pipes. Uh, so this is the leave no one behind. Let's concentrate on that last mile of people and let's try and finish the job. So that's the, that's the message from, from this theme for World War Today. And in terms of um, water usage and getting a strong message out there, that this is a very, very scarce resource. It's costing. What we don't realize is when we open the tap, we don't realize that as the water is being piped down, that's actually money going down the drain. Yeah. And we don't apply our minds to that concept, do we? And maybe a campaign can be built around that to show the money actually going down the drain. That's true. Mm -hmm. But we only we don't realize this until we're in a drought. Mm. So if you look at what happened in Cape Town, people started collecting the rain, their showering water, and using it to flush, and those type of things. It's only when we're in trouble that we decide, oh wow, I, you know, we just don't have enough water. I think we should be more forward-looking and this is why it's good to, to come and speak on shows like yours where we can inform the world, inform our community to say, we just don't have enough water. By 2030, our own demand for water as a country will outstrip supply. Ooh. And if you look at 2030, it's, about it's 11, around the corner. It's 11 years. <clears throat> if we don't start making these changes, we're going to run into big trouble. What are the simple changes that we can make at home? Because I'm thinking, you're talking to 68 um, countries internationally at this point in time, and if the 68 countries equate in maybe 20 million people or 100 million people, individually, you know, each one of us make a difference and collectively it can be awesome, can it not? So what are those small little changes we should be doing? Don't let the tap run, try and have showers, fit in low shower heads, uh, you know, small, simple things that won't cost you an arm and leg. You know, uh, in the droughts, they would say, put a brick in the cistern, so you use less to flush. It's just small things. If you have a garden, save your rainwater. Use that for, 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 for watering your garden. Put in a little tank, rainwater harvesting, 
and, and use that for your garden. It's, it's, it's free water, it's coming off. Store it, keep it, and use it. Um, try and, if you also have a garden, try and water at night, mm -hmm. water during the day. You're not being very efficient. Of course, because it eva evaporates mm -hmm. during the day. We're also told to recycle our grey water. A lot of people don't, and that's from your washing machine and possibly your um, other, you know, water that you use when you're cooking, etc. But because people don't know the how and they're afraid that re it might involve replumbing and it might come at a cost, what do you say to that? Because I think we can save a lot of water that way. Uh, the plumbing, yes, it can come in a cost, but it depends on how your household is set up. I think if you're using stuff from the washing machine and using it to irrigate your plants, I don't see a problem. Uh, I think the kitchen waste might be difficult because you might have more fats and grease that might, that might be in there, so I would prefer washing your normal washing or your bathing water would be better. But not the kitchen water. I don't think if you, especially if you make oily foods. <laughs> I, I don't think. <laughs> okay, be so before you leave us, the situation in South Africa, our dam levels, and apart from Cape Town, because we know they get their rainfall in the winter, what does the rest of South Africa look for this current season? We're always told, we know here in Johannesburg, we've had a fair amount of rain, and I kind of wonder, people are complaining about a drought, but look at the rain we're getting in Johannesburg. What's our situation like? It depends where the rain is falling. Um, and people also get confused, you know, in the coastal cities. Oh, but it's raining here all the time. But it's not raining where the dams are. And so we need to look at that more carefully. Okay. Uh, as a country, I think you can measure, you can look at some of the Department of Water and Sanitation sites and look at dam levels. I think there are various sources where you can look at it. But also I think we should just look into it ourselves first. And take, responsibility. and take responsibility. Your final message to our viewers today and World Water Day is actually today, am I right? I, I 21st. Forget. No, I think it's 20, 22nd. All right, be that as it may, it's still yeah. in March. Your final message to our viewers on World Water Day, how we can be more responsible and conserve this very precious commodity. Just think of what happens when you don't have water. What would you do? How would you clean? How would you drink? It's a basic necessity of life. Mm -hmm. Save it. Okay. Oh. Thank you indeed. We hope and pray people are going to take you really seriously and start thinking and applying their minds to saving water. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure entirely. That was Dr. <coughs> Sudhir Pele, Research Manager at the Water Research Commission, talking about World Water Day and how you and I collectively can make a huge difference on our water reserves. Still to come, we're going to talk to Nosy Newtons with Fatima Patel. She is a biochemist by profession and she's come up with this amazing idea. Can't wait to hear what it's all about. And welcome back to the final segment of the show this morning. I have the lovely Fatima Patel in studio. She's a biochemist and a mom of three lovely little tots. She's here to talk about a concept that she's developed. It's called Nosy Newtons. And I just absolutely love um, the, the, the name that she's given to this concept, Nosy Newtons. Let's unpack it. And I'm sure it has to do with science and biology and technology and all of that. But let's hear what Fatima has to say to us. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam. And thank you very much for having me on. My pleasure entirely. Now, you are a biochemist by yes. profession. Yes, I am. And uh, you're here sitting with us in the studio with the most amazing, <laughs> colorful um, paraphernalia. Child, really. yes. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> but they're not toys, are they? No, these are not. These are working equipment. Okay. Um, it's used in our classes. In your classes. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, you've got a program and you say it's STEM-based educational uh, approach which targets the, the, the grave need in our country, absolutely. which is obviously science and technology. And I should imagine maths fall under that as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Why and how did you come up with this concept and you truly believe it's going to fill that gap in the market? Well, look, um, Trudy, there is a 
marked, um, you know, well-documented lack of technical, scientific, mathematical skills in our society. In fact, in all over the world. And STEM is a revolutionary new educational concept that uses, well, that targets the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and math as interpreted through an, an art medium. Um, it targets the younger children because they believe that, you know, the younger we start, the better it is. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so who's come up with the concept STEM? Because you call your concept uh, Nosy Newtons, which yes. I absolutely adore. Oh, I think it's such you. a clever name. <laughs> and I'm sure even the kids are very chuffed about that. Absolutely. We've got a, a skeleton that uh, joins us every now and again, wow. Sir Isaac. And um, okay. so he's our, our mascot. So Newton is actually my favorite scientist. Right. And that's where the name Okay, let's with. go back to STEM. Yes. How did you tie in with STEM and how did you think that this would be workable? All right. Um, once I started Nosy Newtons, I went back to study. I went to study for my postgraduate wow. in higher education. Right. Um, the reason I went that route was I wanted to specialize in curriculum development in order to provide a holistic um, curriculum for Nosy Newtons. And while I was studying there, um, I came across the STEM concept, which has been around um, in other parts of the world for a little while now. It's new to South Africa, and um, it just fills the gap perfectly. Is it being used in state schools at the moment, STEM? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it, STEM being used? Not in not. our schools yet. Okay. And how are you going to then develop this partnership and roll this out? Because obviously, I should imagine the long-term plan is to try and get this to as many young people as you Absolutely. possibly can. Absolutely. Look, government has, in, in, the, in the State of the Nation address, has identified a need for increasing technological subjects. I see they've introduced a few more. And we have seen that they have acknowledged the need to look towards our future being or our future children being innovators, producers of technology rather than mass consumers. So I feel that Nosy Newtons gives your child a little bit of an edge. You see, the, the whole aim of Nosy Newtons was to inspire, ignite and create a love for science. And you know, to allow children to experience science without fear or bias, because generally when you ask a child somewhere along, you know, when they have to choose subjects in matric uh, um, or I think it's grade 10, they are fearful of absolutely, the scientific subjects. Absolutely, absolutely they absolutely are. Absolutely fearful. Mm, but if mm. you start off young and you allow that innate curiosity to develop, it's a piece of cake. Okay. So what I, and you Obviously, uh, the what you emphasizing is starting out young. Yes. Don't wait till you get to Absolutely your senior uh, senior classes, and you're having to then choose yes. where the science is going to be one of your subjects. Find out if it's your passion now. So, when would you introduce kids to Nose in Newtons? Okay, my program is uh, targeted for the preschool. Wow. Um, age group. So we look at grade R and um, we've got uh, double R as well. I do have a toddler science program oh, as well for word. the littlest ones. Okay. Um, basically in the toddler science uh, field we look at uh, things like the droppers and things like that. And when you say toddlers, we're talking four-year-olds? <coughs> we're talking four-year-olds. Four, four five-year-olds. Four, okay. Three to four-year-olds. We try and increase their tactile development. Try and decipher whether these are auditory learners or visual learners and try and use that to our advantage. How do you decipher that? Okay, we start off our lessons by running through the whole experiment. So there's a visual demonstration where I run through it and then after that we work step by step. So I call out the steps and then you follow through. And I find that we have some learners who identify immediately. They can see what we're doing and then that's the way they work. Then you have a lot of students who want to hear each step ah. and they prefer to go according to that. So you have to identify and you have to understand your student as well. Um, it's a very hands-on program. So you will find me often in class on my hands and knees, sitting down with the children. We generally like to work in very open spaces. It allows them to, you know, to direct the conversation as well as increase inquiry, 
try and explore for themselves and express themselves and express I think themselves. importantly and also I think what you're doing here with these amazing primary colors is that you're stimulating Absolutely. them and you are piquing their interest and their curiosity yes um, just by that uh, demonstration there, I can see it's easy on those nimble little fingers. Yes, and, and it must increase your tactile um, abilities, right. your fine motor skills, gross motor mm -hmm. skills. These are things that you will need as it is throughout primary school. Okay. Um, you're not working at schools. These are almost like extracurricular. This, yeah, Nosy Newtons is basically an interactive extramural. All right. So we offer them to the schools and we contracted to a school, a particular school. We come out once a week and we present a lesson. For about a, an hour? For about, about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. so. so the school has to contract with yes. you. What about people watching us this morning and they want to get a group of kids together and probably have you Absolutely. over on the weekend? Awesome, awesome, we do do that. And we also have our very popular holiday programs. Right. Um, and that's, it's available to everybody. We have to cater, obviously, for a certain age group, so I like to keep my ages um, together. So, sure. for example, the small ones in, a, in one group and the bigger ones in another group. Um, what that does is it allows, it, to, it allows me to cater for a different type of student of again. Right. Somebody who can do more and with the younger ones perhaps less. Yeah, and I'm sure you don't want to frustrate <coughs> the children because if you mix the different age groups, yes. they're going to feel, I can't. A younger Absolutely. child will start losing self-confidence. So you've got, to be very, you've got to be very discerning 100%. when you put your program together. Now, I'm wondering if you're saying that you work with schools as an extra mural. Yes. mural. Um, it's not a once-off. It's, 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 it's a tried and tested designed program Correct. that you've got to go back and back and back so yes. it probably runs for an entire year we run we have a rolling two-year curriculum wow um, what that does what it allow, allows nosy newtons to do is to take a child from double r right through to r following the nosy newtons program we cover all the aspects of the scientific fields we use we look at chemistry physics engineering mathematics botany, biology, so we cover various experiments. Mm -hmm. And at that young age, I should imagine, you use all those big words Absolutely. to familiarize them with all of that. Th that's one of our aims, mm -hmm. is to increase familiarity with and scientific terminology, with me methodology. Also, it allows our children to understand that there's much more out there. Oh, absolutely. And um, it, it allows them to express themselves and find out which areas you know, excites them, which one, del which one they should delve into. We have a program as well once a month where we uh, bring in an iconic scientist, that experiment, and we try and replicate it and see, you know, how that experiment made that particular scientist famous. Wow. So you have your Newton's beads, right. things like that. Mm -hmm. We also have a myth-busting class. Ooh, okay, let's, awesome. hold, let's yes. hold that for after the ad break. Fatima Patel is in studio with us talking about nosy Newtons and the camera will take a wide shot here. You'll see all these colorful, um, it's not toys. No. It's educational, well, I, I think I, I can safely say it's educational toys. And if you get your kids enrolled in this uh, program, I think they're going to have lots and lots of fun. But more importantly, they're going to learn some very valuable skills skills and who knows you might have a little newton on your hands don't go away we'll be back right after the ad break Fatima Patel from Nosy Newtons is in studio with us. She comes from the Val Triangle by the way and I just asked her off air where this is available anywhere else in our immediate vicinity or perhaps in the rest of the country. And the good news is that she is busy uh, trying to create, um, what A is franchise. it? Franchises. And I hope you've patented all the stuff. Yes. Okay, so she's busy, <laughs> she's busy creating franchises. So if you have a passion for children, if you have a passion for science, technology, maths, etc., then this is your go-to person. You can then sign up for one of the franchises and you can have these programs running in your area. 
Um, how soon can this all happen, people who are interested in um, opening up a franchise? Look, it's in, it's, I won't lie to you, it's in the pipeline. You know, the pipeline. Um, so I can't give you an exact date, but um, everybody's welcome to contact us and uh, we will definitely get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, so you offering this in the Val Triangle for now? Uh, currently in Gauteng. In Gauteng. Yes. Uh, yes. And you don't mind going out on a Saturday no. or after afternoons, etc., just yes. to run these classes. But this is not a once-off. It's a program. It's a it's program. It's a program, and how long does it run? Okay, our program runs for, for two years. Two years yes. in total. Two years in total, but you have the option of signing up for a year um, as you wish. And it's once a week, once over a, week. a period of a year or two years, yes. and once a week running for 45 minutes. Correct, running according to the school calendar. Okay, do you prefer working at schools only? I, well, actually not. Um, look, I, I wish to just get my message out there. If I can inspire one child, I think my job would be done. Perfect. This, this, this looks amazing. I see you've got a pair of goggles here as well. Yes, that we emphasise safety a lot um, mm -hmm. in class. So, right. you see, equipment is very important. Sure. It will take you further when you, um, in your university career. A lot of the students, they are unfamiliar with any sort of lab equipment. Right. And this gives them an idea or a chance to at least get Absolutely. a little bit of um, interaction in. So, as you register, you've got your goggles. Um, in here, we've got the massive magnifiers. <laughs> um, very nice and colorful. They've got stands, things like that. We use these in our classes. Um, our classes generally have a lot of chemistry because children love to blow things up. Let's just be honest there. And uh, we have individual stations for each child. So everything is interactive and individual, one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, the child gets to actually explore his or her Abilities. Okay, what I'd like to suggest is if you could just hold up the um, the instruments and just show it to the camera right. and just talk us very quickly through the different instruments. And then I also want to ask you who helped you develop this amazing concept. It's really very, very well made. It's colorful. It looks very durable. Okay, this is bought. Okay. I haven't developed this. All right. This is bought. Um, and, and, and scientific toys are definitely readily available. Which means when you go to a school, when, when a school signs up with you, does that mean that each child needs to buy their own equipment or you just no. go in with one no. set of equipment? We just go in with one set of equipment. We try and use things that are readily available. Mm. So this here would be a side note. Um, they would use this when they need to. Mm -hmm. For example, um, just last week we did indicator solutions. Mm -hmm. And because and what it's is a, that? Okay, a, a pH indicator solution. So basically, all we needed there was our test tubes, mm -hmm. and we did an inorganic, uh, I mean, um, an organic tester solution made out of red cabbage. Wow. Uh, the reason we do that is we try and steer clear of a lot of, you know, harmful chemicals. chemicals Kitty, right. Kitties are still small, and we have to take precautions. Right. And. We, are, we then tested a few solutions, lemon juice, bicarb water, and it gives you such a lovely array of colors. Mm -hmm. And the visual appeal of any of our science experiments is what makes a difference. We've done magnetism, uh, so we've made our own magnetic slime. How do you do that? Oh, it's very... Uh, and I know slime is, is a big thing with children at absolutely. the moment. Absolutely, they go and crazy uh, for it. And you're talking magnetic, so what's yes. so different from the regular slime that kids are now involved in? We made our regular slime, and um, that was one of our lessons. And we understood the properties of, uh, you know, um, what, what slime is actually made out of. And then we added in our magnetic powder to increase magnetic ability and we used different types of magnets to test the strength wow. of that. Okay. The kiddies then get to take their magnetic slime home along with their magnet so they can show off a bit at home. Of course. Yes. Um, what else can you share with our viewers as far as the schools? You know, apart from exposing them to science and technology, what yes. other skills are they going to be picking up? Okay, we've got a lot of things to offer with in terms of nosy newtons. First and foremost, they learn teamwork because at, at the, the bottom so line important. is, yes, the bottom line is at some point they are going to either be part of a team or at least managing a team. Mm. So they learn to work in groups as well, as well as in an individual basis. Next, we also learn a lot of scientific terminology. So they become 
kind of au fait with that, you know, those words. From a very like early that. age, from a of very course. Early, yeah, from a very early age. So if they had to go to primary school and hear about photosynthesis, it's not going to be Greek to them. Right. They will be aware of what is mm -hmm. happening in that process. We also learn methodology. So there's a step-by-step -step method. You know, science is repeatable. Absolutely. Or it has to be repeatable mm -hmm. in order for it to be um, effective. And we allow our children to understand methodology or the importance of methodology. Further, they learn the different ways that things are built in our engineering section. We build bridges. We test strengths of, bri uh, of bridges as well. And it allows them to see the science that is everywhere. It's mm -hmm. all around us. Mm -hmm. From an Islamic perspective as well, I mean, to know your cre you know, to know the world Absolutely. around you and creation is to know your creator. And mm -hmm. we'd love for children to have that innate curiosity. And the, the, the fact remains, we need to produce technology. Mm -hmm. We Absolutely. need to be, you know, we need to steer our children away from being mass consumers and innovating. And we're not saying that each and every one of them going are going to end up being little scientists no. or scientists in later life. Correct. But you, you talk about moving them away from mass consumerism. Yes. Um, what exactly are you saying? What we are saying is that we can allow our children to try and explore new things, to try and develop new things, to try and build new things, which is what we need. To be discerning, to, be to apply discerning, their minds. To apply their minds, to apply knowledge that they've gained. Um, what this will do is, you know, in terms of growth for our country, this will vastly help with that. I mean, in the State of the Nation Address, the President mentioned that we need to increase growth True. and we need to increase the technical skills level that is available in our country. Let's assume that, and there'd probably be children out there or parents who believe I don't really want my child to become a little Newton or anything. Correct. Um, I just want him or her to be kept busy one day a week for a half an hour, yes. 45 minutes. <laughs> what are they going to walk away with? Okay, that's awesome. Those kids are more than welcome as well. <coughs> Excuse me. They, um, well, every week we have an experiment, um, basically, of the week, and it's either focused in physics, chemistry, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. We have a take-home experiment where they get to do the experiment in class, take it home for further experimentation, and they can uh, basically explore and delve further into it at home. We give them options. Uh, for example, I have a lot of students that like to go home and try out you know, additional steps to that experiment. We ask them to send us our, their videos wow. of, their, of what they've done, and it's wonderful. Um, for, for example, the pH testing, I had children who were testing pool water. <laughs> I had children who were right. testing borehole water, okay. you know, river water. Mm. And it was, and Sprite. Okay. Sprite was a, a, quite a popular one. Why so? Um, because the cold drink, you know, everybody okay. wanted this, but we like to test clear liquids right, so we can right. see a color change. But it was really, really amazing. Firstly, it was a bit of research that they had to do themselves. So they're learning, what, that, yes. they're learning that as a skill as exactly. well. Exactly. So mm -hmm. what can I think of that will be you know appropriate to be tested okay let me test my pool water okay let me test the water that came out of the borehole but i'll test the neighbor's water that came out of the tap and we can see the difference and so, the color changes are so awesome so they get an idea we fascinated by it so what about the kids <laughs> yes um you obviously have a set curriculum i do and of Lots of hard work and preparation has gone Absolutely. into that. Do you change it from year to year? Do you kind of stick with it because it works? It does work. However, we always need to be improving. Absolutely. I firmly believe that. So this year we've introduced um, our coding chemist. And it will be a little introductory lesson into coding. So we'll be introducing the binary alphabet wow. and things like that. I, had to, I went back to study um, and see how that I hope it pans out well because Inshallah. coding is, is a very important aspect Going for the forward, future. Absolutely. absolutely. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I just think this is amazing. Lots Thank of success so for the future. We do hope lots of those franchises, once you're ready, obviously, yes. that the franchises get taken up. And any further newer developments, give us a shout. We'd love to talk to you. Thank you so much for having us. It was lovely having you. Thank you indeed. Have a great day. You too. And that's where we leave it this Saturday morning. Great to have had you as uh, company. 
and I do know that you've enjoyed all of the interviews this morning. All I can say to you is it's wrap-up time, and that means you've got to take care on the roads. Till the next time, as always, it is Assalamu Alaikum and Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali.